welcome to our third uh, roundtable workshop on NMR operations. I think we've got a great meeting with a lot of stuff and I'm looking forward to it. Um, before we uh, get going, I'd like to turn things over to John Webb, our sponsor from MR Resources. Th thank you, Dave, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be. And uh, MR Resources is very, very happy to uh, bring yet another uh, Ivan Zoom meeting to uh, uh, everyone. Uh, we've got a uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, topic, as you all know, today. And uh, uh, very good attendance. Uh, gee, I think we're expecting 160, 170 people. Uh, very happy to uh, bring these meetings to you. Uh, uh, as a lot of people know, MR Resources has uh, uh, been around for 35 years now and uh, providing uh, very high quality reconditioned uh, broker and uh, barium NMR spectrometers and services. And uh, I'm just, I'm very, very happy that uh, we're in a position that uh, we, we can do this. Uh, 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 Dave Rice, uh, myself, uh, Dan Iverson, and uh, Chris Krishnamurthy uh, founded uh, uh, the Ivan Group just a little more than uh, four years ago at this point. And like I say, just very happy that uh, we, we can bring these uh, things to you. Uh, just a couple of brief announcements uh, before we uh, go back to uh, Dave Rice to begin the uh, meeting. Uh, I'll ask Chris to uh, uh, give a couple of words, if you would, on uh, uh, next week's meeting coming up on uh, metabolomics. And uh, uh, Chris, what would you like to tell us about that? Thanks, John. Um, yes, uh, in parallel to this um, lab workshop meetings, we are also running uh, research uh, workshops, uh, roundtable workshops. Last month, we did uh, one on um, anisotropic trilogy, parameter trilogy by uh, Roberto Gill. Uh, next week, the second uh, research roundtable workshop uh, is on uh, NMR-based metabolomics. Uh, this will be led by uh, Professor Hetzakis from Ohio State, and he'll be joined by um, Professor Sorrento Costidis from the University of Leiden. Um, it, interestingly, this time, uh, we'll also have two panelists. They are PhD students, uh, Catherine Williamson and Fen Feng Kang. And it's going to be very interesting to hear perspective, not only for the researchers, but also from students who are actually practicing uh, this, uh, this science. And so hope to see you all uh, next week. It's on the September 23rd, uh, Wednesday at uh, 12 noon Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, if you have not received any email related to that to register, please go to Ivan website and you should be able to find a link to register for that. Thank you. I will pass it back to John. Is that uh, you or? Uh, th thank, you. thank you, Chris, and uh, we appreciate that uh, information. Uh, I'll ask uh, Dan Iverson to uh, uh, give an update on uh, Ivan Spin Sites. Uh, if you would, uh, please, Dan. Certainly. The Ivan team sponsors an NMR forum on Slack called Ivan Spin Sites. Uh, it's a place where NMR people can dis discuss anything related to NMR. Membership is open to anyone, not just very Agilent users. And you can join the current 226 members uh, with a link I'll send in a chat message. That's that's thank you, Dan. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Don Bouchard to uh, say a couple of words on uh, Q1 instruments. And uh, after that, uh, we will uh, be off and running. We invite you to get to know Q1. Q1 designs and manufactures NMR spectrometers from 400 to 600 megahertz with features for routine use and the research laboratory. Want to upgrade an older system without blowing your budget? Q1 can retrofit AS and UltraShield magnets with complete upgrades, including automation, for less than you think. Q1 offers NMR instruments with excellent performance at an unbeatable price. Experts know the key to performance is the probe, and Q1 offers smart tune and match probes made by Q1 Tech. Q1 Tech has decades of experience and leads the market in innovation. Q1 STM probes have a patented hybrid tuning mechanism, which means faster tuning for improved th throughput and unmatched reliability. Q1 offers their 400 megahertz instrument with STM probes in three configurations, 
a two-channel probe with fluorine tuning on both X and H channels for maximum flexibility. Or fluorine detection can be isolated to the X or H channel to maximize H sensitivity or to maximize carbon and phosphorus sensitivity. Q1 Tech STM probes are also integrated into Topspin and VNMRJ for improved performance and throughput for existing installations. Want to know more? Our websites have additional info. We're also happy to provide remote demonstrations with your samples. Please contact us by phone or email. Thank you, Don. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll pass back to uh, David Rice. And uh, Dave, if you'd like to uh, get things going for us. Okay, why don't we get started? And um, I'll say something about timing. If you've not been to one of these meetings before, uh, Ken will, uh, will um, lead the panel of, of, of speakers. Um, usually that lasts until about uh, 1240 or so. Today we've got a really great group and with a lot of material, we might go a bit longer, though we're gonna try really hard to keep on time. And uh, the one couple rules, uh, Eric mentioned that you should stay muted during the presentations, but then after uh, the presentations are over, we encourage your direct questions to the group. In the meantime, though, certainly put your questions in the chat and uh, people will be monitoring the chat. And also I would ask you if you could also close your video uh, during the presentations so that we can focus on the pictures of the panelists. Um, so with that, I'll turn things over to Ken and we can get started. So uh, really excited to have this panel today. Um, we have a lot of members of the community who are really willing to uh, help out with this kind of stuff. And I was able to put together a really solid panel of people with a number of uh, different systems from the major vendors here in the United States. Uh, this talk is intended to be very sort of practical in nature and for people who have who already have systems who want to kind of talk to your peers uh, about issues you're having and things like that. And also for people who are considering getting systems who might not be aware of what your options are as far as system types, what's involved in getting those systems up and running and who the big uh, vendors are to talk to. Um, so we're going to start with... Um, three people who have quantum dynamic systems. We have two presenters, uh, Chris Withner from Colorado State and David Liv from uh, University of Georgia. And uh, Todd Rapp is also here from the University of Minnesota who will be available for questions. Uh, we'll move on to uh, speaker Alan Kershaw from the universe, uh, University of Southern California who will talk about his quantum technology systems. And we also have James Zeramini here from the Advanced Science Research Center at SUNY, uh, who will shortly have a quantum technology system. So he's going through the process uh, live and in person if you wanna hear about what that's like. Uh, and then fine, or not finally, but next we have Cryomech, uh, which we have KZ Shine from the University of Arkansas. And we're gonna wrap things up with a, a brief talk from uh, Sarah Katie of Iowa State, who has a, uh, uh, their system is tied into a university physical plant recovery system. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it off to Chris uh, Rittner, who will give our first talk. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we have a healing recovery system at Colorado State University. Uh, and the, we started this operation back around 2012, 2013. Took us four years. Uh, the major criterion that we were using was that it be turnkey. Uh, we have six total NMRs, uh, currently three are, are on this, plus we have a uh, quantum design um, MPMS squid, which uses a lot of helium. So that was our, uh, that's what we were uh, trying to circumvent. So turnkey funding sources are internal, uh, internal programs uh, from uh, the state of Colorado and from uh, return on overhead. The total cost of the system in two phases was uh, $250,000 for equipment, and about $50,000 for the engineering that went into uh, lines and pipes and you know having people come out. Uh, lots of 
costs and issues. We can certainly discuss these in greater detail. Uh, you know, as I said, two stages. The first of these was a direct recovery uh, connected to the uh, uh, squid. And then later we added the high pressure recovery system. Uh, we, uh, the maintenance costs on this are about $8,000 a year. Uh, most of that is in the, uh, is in the, uh, the uh, helium uh, cold finger and, and the, the various components that go into that, uh, you know, seals and so on. Lots of different surprises. Uh, physics is not the least of them. Uh, helium is an interesting fluid. Uh, the cost, the operational cost, which is for the most part not covered by us, is uh, is reflected in the 10 kilowatts uh, per liquid liter that, that you're um, uh, using. Uh, we use balloon grade helium. Uh, we also use liquid helium. We don't have all of our instruments hooked up for a variety of reasons. And uh, of course, recovery helium. Uh, so uh, recovery efficiency de uh, depends. It's between 90, 50 and 90%, depending on the instrument. Uh, so the, the biggest problem with, you know, that, that they were asking us is just what are our experiences, project engineering, uh, finding design professionals that can speak with quantum design at the time. This is fairly early. I think quantum design is a little further along now. And then you have to worry about space, uh, noise and heat. Uh, how do you manage that? Uh, these things are, are quite noisy. We use a, um, a uh, liquid um, coolant system for hours in a, in a facilities provided um, plant. Uh, unexpected events and surprises, back pressure, bottlenecks, uh, contamination, leaky manifolds. Uh, I changed my mind about what I wanted to do several times. That's never good uh, when you're dealing with uh, civil engineers uh, and uh, sort of you know, figuring out what parts to use. Uh, this is your direct recovery. These are just some diagrams you would see if you talk to quantum design. On your left, and it's very simple. You have the ATL. You have, uh, in this case, a squid, and and then you have the compressor for the helium, plus a control system, and the total cost for that was about one hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollars. The re, the uh, high pressure design is more complicated. You have a balloon. You have multiple instruments, including the squid and a Mars. They all have different things that they uh, need. There's a high pressure helium compressor and uh, a tank farm. There are controls for all of this, of course, um, and, uh, the, uh, and a uh, helium purifier, which is actually very important. Uh, they call it the ATP. Uh, you'll see other examples of how people do that um, you know, in, in the presentations. This is real and live. Here you see the, uh, the purifier, number one. Number two is the um, the actual ATL, uh, 160 liter capacity, and, and we uh, get production up to 30 liters per day, believe it or not. Uh, there are, uh, there's a helium compressor, there is a cartridge for, for removing water vapor from the helium stream. Uh, this is a, uh, these are tanks we would purchase from our gas supplier, so balloon grade helium, and then we have a uh, storage tank. Another view of the same thing over here, you, uh, number one is shown as a just ultra high purity push gas. Uh, this is in the MPMS squid lab. Here you have a manostat, which is uh, controlling the back pressure on the, uh, and you know, relative to uh, basically maintaining the, the pressure on the uh, live helium uh, magnet. And then a uh, valve system, which can be switched for, from uh, recovery to uh, fill mode for, for high throughput. Uh, compressor, this is actually the uh, tank farm we use, which holds uh, the high pressure gas. We have here about uh, 60 liter, uh, liquid liter equivalents uh, in four tanks, plus a uh, system which is provided by Quantum Design to, to manage the, uh, the compressor. Uh, finally, here's the uh, balloon. It's in a box because we're protecting it from a variety of uh, animals that come into the uh, facilities area. Uh, this is the quantum design system, the squid. Uh, this is on an old 600. Here you can see the, the, the ball valve, the uh, manostat, the manifold over here. There's a little tiny bit of the uh, number three is the uh, 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 large recovery pipes. This is off of a 400. 
uh, again, mammoth stat, ball, ball valve. And I want to thank you very much uh, to everyone in this community and for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, this was, as I said, funded by uh, our vice president for research and the state of Colorado, of course, taxpayers everywhere. Great, Chris. Thanks a bunch. Um, I have a couple questions for you. First, uh, when you say animals, are you speaking uh, of graduate students or do you have actual animals that come in there and, and chew at your bag? Well, we were concerned about actual, you know, rats, mice, um, but it turns out the biggest animal we have to worry about are the gorillas uh, that are moving through that facility with large wrenches and <laughs> and really don't pay any attention. Uh, it, I mean, it's a common problem, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and and you get it. It's just a big bag, and it's kind of fun. It's squishy. Uh, so we had people bouncing on it and doing other <laughs> silly things. So. So do you fill uh, directly off the ATL 160 or do you transfer uh, into, uh, into another doer? We transfer uh, from the ATL into that storage do doer, the cryofab storage doer. Um, so we actually have a capacity for 260 stored liters of liquid. Uh, that's mostly familiarity. You can use the ATL. It has three pressure modes, uh, but the lowest of those um, is too low really, and the mid, middle pressure is five PSI is a little bit rough for, um, for you know, high field magnet. Uh -huh. And uh, did you start uh, with a direct recovery system and sort of upgrade to a, a full system or, or how did that work? Yeah, so the, the plan was, at, we had the entire plan right away, but we didn't have $250,000 budget. So we did it in two stages. And the first was direct recovery, which we could do with the quantum design, which is design, or sorry, with the uh, MPMS, the squid. Um, I would not do that with an NMR. Um, there are too many, be because of the way we manage NMRs, I think it's probably a little more dangerous. And the issue, uh, in, at least in my hands, would be icing up of the uh, cold finger in the ATL. So you have a lot, lot of downtime, that kind of thing. Oh, great. All right, well, let's move on to our next presenter, uh, Dave Liv from uh, University of Georgia. Uh, uh, yeah, just a, uh, a quick comment uh, from the last talk. Um, with regard to the pressure that you have running in the ATL, you can go into the parameters and set that to anything you want. So, uh, so you could adjust that appropriately. But anyway, okay, uh, uh, starting this, most of this has already been discussed. I estimate maybe 10 $10,000 a year, we change our cold heads, uh, one for the ATL, one for the ATP. Every two years, they they degrade a little bit, but it's still performing quite well. But we, we're so dependent on it, we don't want any unpleasant surprises of something catastrophically failing. So just we're a little bit proactive on it, and there's a little bit of Bauer maintenance. Uh, I must say one thing about the Bauer in, in, in our system where we're generating a lot of helium, it's only on about two hours a day. So it may be noisy, but uh, it's not that big a deal, and you could probably arrange it so it only came on at night if, if you work things out. Uh, our funding was uh, from local sources as well as some uh, money from NIH. Uh, Jim Prestigard did a lot of the effort in, in raising the money, uh, and some of the other people involved with this effort, uh, uh, John Glushka, who manages the facility at the CCRC, Greg Wiley, who was involved with the CCRC facility and also managed the chemistry facility here. This is back around 2012 when we got the system. He's now at Texas A&M. Uh, this is a layout of our system schematic. We have a line, we have 10 inch, 10 magnets uh, in a very big area, fortunately. We have a line that goes all the way around the room. It's the order of 200 feet and another line that goes about another 250 feet down the hall for a, a connect to an FTMS. Uh, it's, they're teed into these bags, which provide low, low pressure storage. And at some point when they reach a certain degree of fullness, the compressor comes on. Uh, the, line, the line goes here, it goes outside to a compressor, um, uh, which is just on the outside wall. Uh, here it is, the power compressor, you just saw one. It goes out to here and then goes back into the lab. This is the split air-cooled unit we have for our ATL. You can get air-cooled or water-cooled. Um, it comes back in the lab, it goes into these high-pressure tanks, this rack, this is where we can connect up uh, purchased helium gas tanks, goes into the purifier, as has been talked, 
this is the compressor for the purifier. It's an air-cooled unit. It's smaller than for the liquefier, and it's actually in the room. So it's, uh, the, the, the heat is dissipated in the room, and it's not a problem because, as in our case, as I say, it's a very big room. Uh, it goes to the liquefier, and then we have a 250-liter doer we transfer into here. This is one with an electrical heater, so we don't have to worry about gas for pressurizing. Uh, factors that went into our choice was we wanted to get a system with a split air-cooled compressor, and at that time, Quantum Design was the only outfit that uh, uh, offered such an option, and we also preferred the, the system with the uh, cold head trap so that we didn't, um, uh, we, we avoided dealing with nitrogen. Uh, the, um, uh, we have this air drying cartridge, uh, helium drying cartridge desiccant, which has been referred to. Uh, we're actually pulling through about 100,000 liters of gas a week, and that's, uh, so even a little bit of moisture gets picked up in the system can be a problem. Uh, there is some advantage to getting an oxygen sensor in the interest of time. I won't go into some of these details. They'll, probably, they'll be up on the website, presumably. Uh, our protocols, we go from the ATL to a 250 liter to, to the magnets for a variety of reasons we don't want to fill from, particularly with real high field magnets from getting this up close to them. Uh, important point is, a transfer is about 80% efficient. Uh, we do two transfers, obviously, to get to the magnet. So by the time you're finished, you only get about 100 liters in the magnet from 160 liters. And the uh, impact of this is if you want to recollect all your gas, and we do collect the gas since evolved during fills, you need a liquefaction capacity, which is at least 1.5 times. I think you're better shooting for two times what your nominal boil off is to make sure you can stay ahead. Uh, that's something you really need to bear in mind when you're designing a system. Uh, so we all, the, the setup for individual uh, magnets is we have a uh, bypass, as you just saw, and a, and a, and a uh, uh, back pressure regulator to isolate the magnets from the line. Uh, this is an example of a magnet. This is the main, this is the ambient boil up going to the back pressure regulator. This is the connection for the, uh, for the main line, which we open this, we open this when we fill and then close it up again. The gas goes through a heat exchanger. These are a bit overkill. There are a variety of different heat exchangers you can get, uh, linear or these kind, uh, and uh, they're readily available. This is one of the bags. Our bags actually hang off the wall because we have a tall room and we can do that. Uh, so they never collapse down to the floor. And then we also have two pump magnets. The gas coming out of the pump, the only one pump is running at a time, uh, goes out through a helium mist filter and back into the line for collection. We have a isolation valve. We also have a relief valve. And it's an important point to make is when you design a system, you want to make sure you have plenty of relief valves in there so you don't run into an accident where an, a, a region gets isolated and then uh, pressure builds up and you know by virtue of somebody shutting off the wrong valve at the wrong time. Um, these are options for back pressure regulators. This is something which the people at Yale proposed and which we are using in, in a couple of cases with just a mechanical back pressure regulator. This ensures that the cryostat stays above atmospheric pressure, which is not the case necessarily with a check valve in the line. And I won't go into for the time, won't go into the details of why that's the case. Uh, this is the kind of uh, back pressure regulator that Oxford offered with air magnets made by a company called Bronckhorst. You can buy these. Uh, these are electronic and are, if your stable, stability is a premium as it is in some magnets as an issue, and the last point I want to make is something which we did recently when we hooked up this FTMS. Instead of dealing with rigid line, particularly when this had to go up through the uh, suspended ceiling and around corners and so forth, we got flexible uh, stainless steel line. This cost $12 a foot, which sounds like a lot, but actually stainless and copper of these diameters is not cheap. And you save a huge amount of labor installation costs with this. And that really runs up the price. Great talk, Dave. Uh, we did have a few questions about um, uh, cryostats and uh, not cryostats, but uh, manostats and what people are using for them. Uh, this is actually directed to, to you and uh, Chris. Uh, look, where are you getting your cryostats and what are you using for those? Well, the uh, I assume when you mean the cryostat, you mean the doer that we use. To I mean the manostat. I keep saying. Oh, okay, the manostats. As I say, there's this. Uh, if you go to the if you go to the Yale NMR website, you'll see the details on that manostat. It's a, you can buy it from a master car. I have the part number on the thing, so it'll be posted on the on the slide on the, presumably on the website. It's about one hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and um, the Bronkhorst is about three thousand dollars. 
Uh, and then Quantum Design, we bought a couple from them. They're, they're somewhat more expensive and they're a bit fancier. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the options we've used. And, and why did you go with a, um, uh, air, uh, uh, not a water-cooled compressor? Why did you want that split system? Out of curiosity. Uh, part of it was we didn't want to overtax. We had a certain amount of water coming in the room. We were running four or five cryoprobes and the piping and so forth would be such. And we were fortunate, although it doesn't have to be this way, we're right next to an outside wall. So it was a trivial way to set it up. Great. All right, well, that's fantastic. Those are our quantum design presentations. I apologize at the beginning <clears throat> for calling those quantum dynamics, uh, but we are moving on to quantum technologies and our uh, next presenter is gonna be uh, Alan Kershaw of the University of Southern California. Um, welcome everybody, my name is Alan Kershaw. I've been working at USC for 38 years now. Uh, I've got my contact information there if you need to get in touch with me after the words. Uh, we have a quantum technology system, which we purchased in June of 2013 and had it come online in March of 2014. <clears throat> we actually started considering systems back in 2010, but at the time we had just had four operating magnets and it was not considered cost effective due to the co low cost of helium at that point. Um, we added uh, two EPR systems with cryoprobes in 2012 and with their extra load and going through, in some cases, 100 liters in a couple of days, we now consider it a practical consideration. We checked out several different systems with about a 20 liter per day capacity. Quantum Tech was the best one we found at that price for about a little over $200,000. And the installation, all the copper piping uh, was over $100,000. Our system is on two buildings over a very long distance, the actual end-to-end -end copper piping is probably close to 100, 150 yards. And so it's a fairly stretched out system and that added to the cost quite a bit. Uh, so here's our system, the actual cryostat and the compressor and a little closet room here, which you're seeing about half of right now. Um, we have in actuality, the quantum tech system was using a cryomech uh, uh, cryostat system. Again, it generates about 20 liters of liquid helium per day. I have a little transfer doer in the back there. It's about 100 liters, and that's how I get the helium to the different magnets and facilities. We have a uh, gas compressor, a KZR system. Uh, in this system, they got the quantum tech has their little manifold mounted on the top, and we're able to maintain pressures of about 0.6 to 1 psi in the system. And if it gets above 1 psi, the compressor kicks in and starts taking the helium out so we can run it. These very low pressures help solve some of the problems. The storage tanks will actually hold about 200 PSI. The issue we had with this compressor is that there's a little storage tank inside that does get high pressure. And when the compressor kicks off, it bleeds off that helium. And so we're actually losing it. And in an operation of 24 hours a day, we can lose about one to two liters of liquid helium. And that wasn't a very good thing. It turns out that the cryomech um, cryostat system has a little heater unit in the doer to help maintain the positive pressure. And what I ended up doing was setting that to about 0.6 PSI, which means that the helium, the heater would then be boiling off about 17 liters of helium from the cryostat internally. And since it's generating about 20 liters, I'm ending up with a net gain of about three liters per day, which is about what the magnets are putting out. And so the compressor very seldom turns on during those processes. Uh, this is our purifier. This is a liquid nitrogen cold finger purifier. It's got a basically large finger here with uh, various um, elements inside to capture the various gases and water and so forth. And we get a helium purity return of about 99.99% on that. <clears throat> These are our storage tanks. Uh, they're 250 gallon tanks. I have seven of them. It's a total of about 85 liters of liquid uh, gas, liquid equivalent. These were our big problems in setting up. As you can see in the tanks, there's about uh, actually 10 of these little ports around the different tanks. And the contractor, when he installed them, did not understand helium. Uh, we, when he set it all up, he pressure tested it at 100 PSI of compressed air. The tanks held beautifully for over a week. We started putting helium in it. And within a couple of months, I realized I was losing quite a bit. 
I ultimately ended up getting a, a helium sniffer and started looking around for leaks and found that almost at least two or three of these plugs on every single tank was leaking badly. So ultimately we went through, resealed them all with epoxy instead of plumber's caulk and that solved the problem. We haven't had much in the way of leak issues since then. Uh, for our connections to our magnets, uh, we've got a fairly simple system. I've got a little flexible line here to minimize vibrational transfer into the magnets. Uh, it then comes down through a pipe system. And over here, you can see a little closer. Um, <clears throat> I have a little valve right here that during regular operation, it's closed. So the boil off gas goes through the little level detector so I can monitor the helium level and dealing with that. When I have to do a fill, I can open up that valve and bypass the little you know, needle valves up in that area. We have a backflow valve here, which is about one PSI, and that helps keep any pressure of doing fills from other areas um, from back pressuring and causing any issues with the magnets. As I said, these are fairly large, far apart, and with that two inch copper line, there's a lot of volume in the pipe, in the recovery pipe, so it helps absorb some of that uh, pressure surging and stuff. I do have a main shutoff valve that I can isolate the magnet from the recovery system if need be, and a little vent valve here, just again, so we don't blow up things with, by closing off different aspects of it. And there's actually a picture of three of our magnets in one big room. You can see the recovery lines and the going off, and then it actually goes through this wall and into the building next door to deal with all of that. And that's what our system's doing. James is going to handle some questions for you. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is uh, Jim Maramini from uh, City University of New York. Um, so as uh, Ken mentioned earlier, um, we are having a system installed kind of at the moment. Uh, it's a little bit delayed from uh, predictably from the events of this year. But um, so we're kind of in the throes of uh, doing all of the retrofitting required for our rooms. Um, and in, in, we've been interacting closely with um, quantum, quantum tech on, you know, the design and everything. So that's been very good. Uh, just, I, I had a quick question for Alan actually on his system. Um, so how far apart or away from uh, your magnets do you install uh, the vent valves? Like, um, a, is, that mean, a, is that an issue or like, uh, how close should they be to the actual, to, to, the, to the magnets? I'm not quite sure what you're saying with that. The vent valve, you mean that? that yeah. I mean, there's like to prevent, to prevent backflow into like, well, there's a fill in another system. <clears throat> it's fairly close to the system. I don't know if you saw that uh, picture. Let me, let me pop that picture back up real quick here. So you can see basically here's the magnet, the vent valve, that little, or that little backflow valve here is physically right there. So we're yeah. only looking at about maybe five feet. So it's, and it's just right after the uh, flow gauge setup. Okay. I, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I guess I'll just pass it back to, to Ken, but I'd be also um, uh, would welcome any questions from people out there for with respect to our experiences so far. So just look me up and uh, send me send me an email. So thanks. All right, next up, we've got uh, Casey Shine from the University of Arkansas, who will be talking about his uh, system using uh, Cryomech. Hello, everyone. My, my, my name is Casey Shane. I work for University of Arkansas uh, Chemistry Department. We have uh, we have a Cryomech system. Uh, at that time, we have a three option to choose: uh, quantum design, quantum technology, and Cryomech. Cryomech uh, costs in between the other two. The the reason choosing of Cryomech is uh, we have a shorter delivery time. Uh, we need a bag for the uh, low magnet fill, and uh, they offer a water cool recovery compressor. Uh, another thing, another important thing is uh, long term uh, maintenance cost. It seems to be um, Cryomag has the lowest. The funding source is uh, internet. Uh, the cost of the system is a little over 200,000. Installation cost, we have a total of 80,000 for. Um, Two phases. The first phase is uh, recover a uh, uh, while off and uh, magnet fail from seven magnets uh, in from a three uh, two laps, and, and uh, uh, that costs about thirty thousand. And the second phase is uh, we adding um, 
seven Tesla uh, mass pass from the third floor in the same bearing. Uh, also, we also added the recovery line uh, for uh, two bearing of uh, chemistry bearing and biochemistry bearing. So that total uh, recovery line is about 600 feet. So this, uh, the brief description is like, uh, we have a 22 liters per day system with 150 liter storage capacity. Uh, we have a liquid nitrogen type uh, purifier. We have 250 liters uh, of our uh, storage dual, which we use for uh, uh, filling it up and, and bring around and fill the other magnets. So we also have a, it's, it's a, it's a we, it's come with the uh, transfer line. Uh, we recover from eight magnets. The daily boil off from eight magnets is about six liters per day. A boil off from the storage is about two liters per day. We try to maintain total liquids around 200 liters uh, every day. So uh, the jury cycle for the uh, liquefier is running about 65% because of we are, are storing more liquid uh, that make it um, uh, liquefier more, more frequent, run more frequent. So uh, we have, uh, we use the, uh, uh, we use the uh, ultra pure uh, gas as a push gas, as well as a makeup gas for the uh, losses. We currently, we lost about 6%. So that estimated about 5,000, a year for the makeup. Uh, another, um, we have our, uh, the bag and the main line pressure set at 0 0.15 psi, and uh, the bag pressure regulator on each magnet set at 0 0.2. So the, the, the flow where we always try it to the uh, recovery bag. So this is our uh, the first phase uh, plan look like. The bag is here and recovery system is uh, in the separate room. This is about 100 feet distance. Uh, we Five magnets recover from this room and the other two here. Uh, Mespas is on the third floor. This is the phase two. Um, this is the one uh, where is the 400 feet of lines um, from the uh, chemistry bearing to the uh, uh, biochemistry. The recovery system is at the biochemistry. So we added this line and all this uh, uh, SS spot for the potential recovery of um, the helium. So this is the bag look like, it, it, it's huge, but um, it, it's worked very well. Uh, purifier, uh, we have that uh, liquid nitrogen purifier here. This is how the liquid uh, helium plant look like. This is the connection to the magnet to the uh, recovery line. We use the uh, heat exchanger for the magnet fail. Uh, this is the bypass valve for for the reg, uh, normal boil off situation. And then uh, we have the flow monitor for the magnet field. We kept this off uh, in, in uh, during the uh, normal boil off because of it's, we found some leaks, uh, potential leaks at the filling here. So we use the uh, back pressure regulator here to maintain 0 0.2 PSI at the magnet. The back is 0.15. So always the, the flow where we direct it to the back. So the maintenance cost uh, is uh, um, projected about $2,000 a year. That include the cohort exchange and absorber replacement for the um, uh, liquefier. This happened uh, according to their schedule. It will happen um, uh, four to five years. They um, they do like 25 to 40,000 hours. But the, the performance they, they said the performance will be lower, but we have been running for two and a half years and it's, it's stay going pretty strong. So I uh, am expecting about four to five years. We, we might have to do that. Uh, we might have to do that cohort exchange. So every day maintenance is more like uh, we drain the water from here. Um, we have a trans, we have to transfer uh, from the liquid helium plant to the uh, transfer drawer. Uh, we have to have the uh, exchange uh, absorber, which is this one. Uh, we have to regenerate and exchange every eight weeks. Uh, purifier, uh, liquid nitrogen trap is this one. We have to, it's, uh, for now it's like once a year. So uh, it's not very, um, we don't have to do it that much. Uh, another one is a, a leak test. We do the um, leak test and the water leak test. We have a water sensor instead of a, uh, um, in case of there is a water leak and flood the building. So we have that and then uh, and expected and surprises. Uh, we have that um, a couple of issue here uh, in the beginning. Uh, helium compressor issue, it did not start 
that, that, that solved by cryomac. Another issue is a helium transfer line problem. It has weak vacuum, they, they also replace it. Uh, purifier also has a problem, but that one is a little strange problem. Uh, currently it's soft bind, uh, it's uh, replacing this uh, lower part of the controller with the non-conductive cover. That seems to solve the problem, So, but it is working right now. And uh, the gas leak, also, of course the leak has a big problem, but we have a, um, in the phase two, we have a lot of time to do the test. So, um, Currently, the line can hold 1.1 psi of helium, so um, I'm happy with that. <laughs> so th that is about uh, seven times higher than um, uh, a normal line pressure, anyway. So uh, I'm gonna stop right now, and then this is my contact. If you have any uh, questions or comment, thank you. All right, thanks, KZ. Uh, Bob is gonna throw a few questions at you. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, this is Bob Berno from McMaster University. So KZ, uh, there were, um, you mentioned that you have about 150 liters of, of uh, helium storage. Now, is that as liquid or is that including all of the storage that you have in the bag and, and as a gas? So how much can you actually store? Okay, uh, the, we can store uh, maximum only liquid of about 300 liters. But 150 liters in the uh, production plant, and we have 250 liters uh, for the storage tank. So normally, we we store combination of a liquid helium plant and the storage for about 200 liters. That is because of uh, we don't have to store as liquid. We we can store as gas, right? But the reason of storing 200 liter liquid is that's some amount we can fill all the magnet. So in case of uh, uh, some equipment failure. We're just gonna go ahead and uh, fill all this magnet, and then uh, we have to think about solving the issues. So since we are not ordering any more hel uh, liquid helium, only option we have is gas. So um, I would like to have uh, you know some liquid to um, you know just in case. So though even that we have only eight weeks to solve the problem. So that is, <laughs> even the, the 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 cost of that is uh, since we are storing more liquids. It's gonna have more bind off there, and then uh, the the helium uh, liquid plant has to make up, you know, uh, a, a liquid again. So uh, we're gonna have more bind off that way. But at least we are trying to save some 200 liters, around 200 liters, just just for in case, just in case, you know, if um, recovery system um, uh, has some problem. Related again to the liquid. Uh, so I, I in in the chats, there's a number of questions asking about. How, how do you measure the amount of liquid you have in your storage tank? Um, are you just using a level meter? Um, but it seems like a, a number of people are using uh, mass. You know, they've got big uh, balances to, to weigh how much helium you have. What, uh, what do you use? Uh, the one, the one, one we order it, uh, we order with the uh, electronic meter, lever meter, uh, very similar to um, the, the, the uh, helium, liquid helium plant come with it. So we, uh, we order that with the uh, liquid uh, storage doer. So we can monitor uh, each fill and see how, which magnet is uh, failing how much. So it seemed to be, uh, we've been doing like a little over two years now, it seemed to be very consistent. I mean, it's, it's not very really that much. So uh, we have electronic, in, in short, we have electronic level meter on the storage tank. I, uh, I appreciate how you mentioned uh, some of the problems you had initially, and, and um, I guess this is kind of normal when you first turn things on, that's right. when you can find things that, that have broken down. But you've been running now for about two or so years. After those initial problems, have, have any new problems cropped up again, or, or is everything working smoothly now? Everything's working smoothly now. We are very happy with the system, uh, other than uh, that, uh, communication issue between uh, liquefier and its computer. Uh, I think it's just, just a so software back box and then we just have to restart the application and normally solve the problem. So it, it does not happen, happen very often. So I, I'm not really worried about it. And then um, they also have a remote uh, monitoring option at the liquid helium plant. So we can kind of you know keep an eye if we wanted to. So yes, and no other issue other than uh, that potential connection um, issues. Uh, it's like it's like a communication issues. So that is, uh, I think it's not that much of a big deal. So 
Ken, uh, do we have time for another question or should we move on? I think we better move on to, to Sarah. And if we have more questions, we'll get those uh, after, after Sarah has given her talk. Sarah Katie from Iowa State is up. Okay, uh, hello everyone. And uh, thank you for coming today. Um, so we're pretty lucky here at Iowa State. We have an institutional helium recovery um, in the Ames lab, low temperature lab, but I'm going to talk about um, how we tie into that and some of the um, problems we've run into over the years. Um, and my email and my Twitter are there if you need to contact me for additional questions later on. So we've had helium recovery at Iowa State since the 60s. Um, the low temp lab in Ames lab has been doing liquid helium and millikelvin experiments for over 60 years. Um, so as we've added buildings, um, all of the superconducting magnets in chemistry, molecular biology, physics, and Ames lab have been connected to helium recovery. Um, we've just been adding new plumbing as buildings were constructed or renovated. So we're not uh, the best example if you're starting from scratch, but we obviously have lots of great examples here today. Um, and some of my photos are coming from a visit that the former University of Illinois um, facility manager came to Iowa State a number of years ago to tour our facility. Uh, so we, in the chemical instrumentation facility, most of our boil off is passive boil off from NMR superconducting magnets, um, which is recaptured at a very high rate of efficiency. Um, we do not have any squid in our facility. We do have an EPR. So the recapture efficiency from these more active experiments is around 50 to 70%. Um, and the helium recovery facility recaptures and purifies and recompresses that boil off. And then it is resold to us and to Ames Lab. Um, we get a price break there, but we do buy it back from them to pay for their uh, equipment maintenance and their staff. Um, so I wanna talk about our helium manifold. Um, the, this is pretty much the same setup for all of our magnets. The helium first passes through this vaporizer uh, that you can see on the left here. Um, that raises the temperature of the helium um, and then it comes through the manifold where we have basically three, four routes it can go through. Um, we have our ping pong flow meter, which we use to, during fills and we typically just leave it in this mode all of the time. Um, we have just a regular low flow meter that has been shown uh, in other systems. And we have a bypass where you don't have to go through any flow meter. Uh, and then we also have, um, you can vent to atmosphere or you can connect a doer to recapture the boil off if you have to keep a doer in the lab for a couple days. Um, during the derecho power outage, we also rerouted to atmosphere uh, because we didn't know what was going on in the helium recovery facility. So that is one advantage of maintaining the facility yourself um, is you sort of always know the status. Um, the manifold that vaporizer can be hidden behind uh, cabinetry if needed and we have that in many different um, configuration scenarios. Um, I, these slides will be posted but here is just a measurement um, schematic of the different um, pipes and connectors we have. Um, the question has come up a couple times. It came up on AMMRL last week and it came up in the chat just now about braised po versus polymer PVC fittings. Um, all of our connections are pretty much braised copper. Um, we connect to the uh, helium recovery with a thick walled vacuum tube and um, low temperature lab, since th that is staffed by two full-time people, they come help us connect uh, any new instrumentation or modify existing manifold if we um, replace a magnet. Um, and that runs over to the low temp lab. So um, one thing that we have changed in the last couple of years is we have check valve on everything. Um, we aren't as concerned about the back pressure. Um, so we don't have to have a manistat in the line that is controlled by the low temp lab. Um, so we just have uh, check valves. A couple of years ago, we had an instance where there was some backflow of moist air into the magnets that didn't have check valves. 
um, and we got ice in some of the magnets. So um, we have probably like three kinds of check valves here. These check valves came with the newer uh, Ascend magnets. Um, we purchased from Bruker, the part number is here, this double side KF25 uh, check valve. And then here we have a lower flow check valve on an older Oxford magnet that we can bypass um, during helium fills. Um, this picture again is from the University of Illinois tour um, when they were recreating the ping pong um, meter. And so the inner profile of the cylinder is, is V-shaped. And so as the flow increases, the ball will rise through the cylinder. Um, so this is an example of how the ping pong looks during the beginning slash middle of the fill. And then near the end of the fill, and obviously in a closed system, you don't get the fogging, but near the end of the fill, the ping pong rises to the top. Um, and so in this way, you can learn to see the motion of that ping pong and how when it starts to rise to the top, you're near the end of the fill and we can stay connected to recovery through um, the helium fill. So uh, thank you again for listening today. And I have a page of additional resources here, um, more about our helium recovery at Iowa State, um, the low temperature lab at Iowa State, and also the Yale helium recovery facility that has some additional resources. So thanks. Thanks, Sarah, that was great. Uh, I wanna thank all of our panelists. Uh, we are on schedule and uh, uh, that was fantastic. So um, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of knowledge here that uh, is available to you guys to, to please ask questions. There have been many that have come up in the chat, but let's, for, before we do that, I wanna pass it back to our panel members to have a little conversation amongst themselves about things that may have come up uh, during the talks. Does anyone want to start? Well, I can make a few comments. If, All right. Uh, having a look at the chat, uh, I think uh, there, were, there was the question about PVC, which appeared in the chat list. Um, and uh, there's a, the, a, a potential risk with PVC is if it gets too cold, it might crack and, and, and relating to the heat exchanger and warming of the gas and also can get brittle over time. Uh, but it, it has been used in places. And in fact, Quantum Design used it in their own, their, their former factory. They had PVC for collecting helium before they, they moved to their current facility. I mean, I saw it in the old facility. Uh, the question of helium level measurements in the cryostat, and at least in our experience, well, some magnets have, have level meters that work while you're filling. So they don't, they're not messed up by the filling. Others, they'll, they'll jump up to some level. And uh, I mean, you can, if you just have to watch it and at some point it starts to read, like we have a couple that will, when you start to fill, it goes to about 65% and you, and, and you won't be able to tell what's going on until you reach 65, but after 65, uh, you can see it continuing to fill. If, if the tank runs out, then what will happen is it'll drop from 65 to the real level because as soon as liquid stops coming in, you, you, the, the level meter doesn't get messed up. And we have a, a couple of which actually hold at 95 until, and you, again, it's, you just watch it. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, 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 the simplest way of doing it. And the other thing I was gonna comment about was there were some questions about how much time it takes, maintenance in normal operation. It really doesn't take, at least in our experience with the quantum design, it doesn't take very much time. I mean, you obviously want to go by and look at it, or you can actually hook these things up to a computer if they're remote and look at it, you know, over the network. Uh, although you have to be a little careful about security, I guess, on that. Uh, but um, the other kinds of maintenance, the transfer from the from the liquefier to the storage doer, in our case, that's all. That, that's quite well automated. You just start it and you go away and come back in an hour, basically, and and just be there for the tail end of it. It's not like filling a magnet where you really have to be careful that <laughs> something doesn't screw up. Uh, and uh, the uh, purifier regeneration is also essentially just a push button, it's automated. Uh, so uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it really doesn't take a vast amount of time, although as with any piece of equipment, you wanna keep your eye on it. I'll piggyback on to what um, David just said. Just want to recommend for anybody who 
is in charge of maintaining one of these high pressure systems. Um, Bauer offers a one week course at their facility in Norfolk, Virginia on operating and maintaining the Bauer compressors. And I went to that and found it very, very useful. It was pretty reasonably priced as well. Yeah, I might add to that. We, we have, and our maintenance of the Bauer, what we have done, although what Todd is talking about might be very valuable, is uh, we have uh, gotten their uh, service, whatever representative to come in and I, like every 2,000 hours, uh, of course we've had ours for a while, they're, they're, they, they recommend checking the valves on the cylinders. And I think we once had the rings replaced as well. Uh, so you can do it that way too. Uh, it wasn't dirt cheap, but it wasn't frightfully expensive. I think it was, it was a couple thousand dollars to get the full up service on after you know a couple of years. So is anyone um, filling, uh, I know on the quantum design systems, there is the option to fill directly from the uh, ATL 160. Is anyone doing that? Is anyone rolling it, uh, rolling it up to their magnet and filling directly from that? Or uh, is everyone transferring to uh, another doer? Uh, we've done that. Uh, and in fact, we use their doer uh, the ATL 160 itself from uh, for transferring into the uh, squid. As David points out, I, I think he said earlier, you can actually change the uh, pressure limits on the ATL for the the, the level of boil off, but or uh, the 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 press the push pressure, if you will. And there are a variety of other things to do that you can do as well. But um, it just it's just more comfortable to be perfectly honest that that's something you can do if you don't want to purchase a cryo uh, container an auxiliary oh. container then you could use the 160 for that i don't know uh, so david said he didn't want to get up real close to the magnets i the highest field i have is a 600 um and you know uh, but i think if you have a say a 900 that's not shielded maybe that is an issue i don't know yeah, we have both a 900 and an 800 that are not shielded. Uh, the, I think we talked to Quantum Design about this once, and I, I mean, one of the other issues is there are <clears throat> apparently some relays in their system, and and so there were, and of course the cold head may have some magnetic parts in it as well. But uh, we just figured it wasn't worth the risk on, on those kind of high field magnets. You, you yeah, wanna, no. You don't want to get yeah, you don't want to get a liquefier stuck to your yeah. magnet. That, that makes perfect sense. And uh, another thing I'll point out with, so we have uh, the doer we purchased does have the uh, heater and you can adjust that, the pressure on that as well. And, and it's really nice. It's a, you don't, you have to use push gas at all. Um, and it, it also has a uh, mechanical um, uh, sensor basically that's, um, that, monitors so it's less expensive you can monitor the the, uh, the volume of liquid in the doer and so that answers two questions that's a way to if you know roughly how much liquid you need to transfer you have a way to do that I, someone else pointed out they use a, a balance but one thing one gotcha with some of those features is that uh, on a uh, magnet with a fringe field uh, the, the meters themselves are uh, affected by the field so you have to be very careful uh, and I'm um, talking hi. about the storage door. Hi, so this is Jack Lee uh, from UC Santa Cruz. Um, I just received, we, we just finished installation of the our quantum design recovery system. And two weeks ago, I did uh, do a helium fill directly from the ATL. So I have three magnets and one of my magnets is a 500 unshielded magnet. And I was able to push the ATL fairly close to the, the magnet. And I was able to adjust the pressure. So, so there are six level setting of pressure you can adjust. So I was able to make a constantly stay at one PSI pressure and the gauge, everything works. And I was able to see the, the helium, helium level inside ATL while I fill. So I thought that was pretty nice. So that way I know how much I put in the magnet. And Jack, is that a, uh, a high pressure recovery system or a direct recovery system or what, what kind of uh, system it's, is that? It's actually a medium pressure system similar to Allen's. So, so I, I don't have uh, the, the balloon bags. So we, we have three large uh, 
you know, those big, big uh, ballast tanks. And then we still go through uh, dryers. We still, and we have the nitrogen liquefier, the purifier, the trap, and then it goes to the, the ATL. Yeah, I'll, I'll say uh, again, echoing what David said earlier, the ATP, the, the purifying system is really nice. And that was something we wanted was uh, as is really to have as little um, effort on this as we could manage or staffing. Um, and, you know, so you have experts that can monitor uh, it's remote control um, through, uh, through Wi-Fi. So, or actually through a direct connection on the internet. So you can, connect into these, but the ATP is very, very nice. And we um, do the cleaning cycles on those in tangent with some of the other things that you do. So there's really very little lost time and you don't have the liquid nitrogen, but it's, you know, more expensive for sure. So that's an issue. So uh, James, I understand you have uh, like a brand new quantum technology system coming. Um, did you want to, uh, I don't know if you're able to, but to sort of compare and contrast that with what you saw on Allen's system? Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty similar to Allen's. Um, we have, in our situation, we have, uh, we're tying in four magnets and then uh, across the hall down here, we, there's a crowd physics group that has three cryostats uh, ranging, uh, so five, seven, and 14 Tesla. Um, so to loop them in, we actually, in the, during the process, upgraded our, uh, our system from 20 liters per day to 40. So uh, Quantum Tech uh, has a 40 liter per day uh, design. Um, all of the components are gonna be kind of housed sort of on the other side of the wall for me in the neighboring lab, which has got a lot, a lot of space. Uh, so, um, and at the moment, basically the Piping is being, uh, it's copper piping throughout. Um, that was sort of, kind of ties into a question brought up earlier about PVC. Um, our, according to our codes in the city, uh, in New York, uh, we had to use copper piping. We couldn't use CPVC, CPVC for example. Um, uh, so, so it kind of went that way. Uh, so it's two inch copper piping throughout. Um, we're talking about 300 feet altogether, 320. Um, so the labs uh, involved are pretty close in space. Um, so yeah, so it, basically the components are pretty similar to Allen's. It's an HR3 recovery compressor where the gas will be collected initially uh, on nitrogen uh, cooled uh, purifier. It's going to be an automatic, uh, automated system. And then um, uh, 40 liter per day liquefier. So, and two cold heads. So um, basically the electrical, so all of our facilities people are, are doing the, um, the plumbing elec electrical. We have to reroute some um, uh, chilled water for um, the liquefier. Uh, um, but that's uh, pretty minor. Uh, so pretty well everything is more or less in place uh, for our instrumentation to be, you know, uh, the rest of it to arrive on site and then be installed hopefully next month. So James, uh, Bob Bruno from McMaster. So you uh, mentioned you mentioned a nitrogen purifier. Uh, there was a question in, in the chat asking about nitrogen purifier versus the, the cold finger, which I think a few of the other systems talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, can you or, or perhaps any of the other panelists who have systems comment about pros and cons uh, between the nitrogen uh, purifier versus the cold finger? Yeah, I think, um, uh, I guess, you know, not having direct experience yet, <laughs> uh, the the maintenance for the for uh, the fingers is going to be less. So I can I guess I'll throw, I could throw it out to everyone else on the panel. But um, so my understanding is there's there there's going to be less maintenance with the uh, with the with the with the fingers like a cryogenic uh, finger. So I don't know how what if anyone else can comment on that. I can speak on my uh, cold finger system, uh, and that's the, um, I generally will, maybe about every couple of weeks, 
take it offline, pump it down, you know, warm it up, pump it down with a good high vac pump for a while, for several hours, and then put it back in. Um, it, you know, it may, other, than, other than that maintenance, I've never had to replace the materials, the, the little pellets inside it. Um, they seem to be, you know, working well, and I'm still getting, you know, good high purity by checking it with a little purity meter at the end of the line there, and it seems to be behaving itself very well for almost seven years now. So very little maintenance in that other than doing that. Um, I have, I mentioned earlier, I just or respond on the chat line, but I do have two EPRs with cryoprobes, and I've had a lot of problems with the cryoprobe users letting air get into the system. And I've at times have literally had 25% you know, air contamination in the helium coming back from those instruments. Now the, the finger can take care of that. I get, it comes back after going through the finger back at zero, you know, essentially zero contamination, but it does saturate the finger much, much quicker. And I have to do the purifying cycles and the cleaning cycles much more frequently, sometimes even every other day it was so bad. And there were a couple of times before I learned this problem that that actually the fingers got saturated and the air got into the cryostat and basically coated the cryostat uh, a cold head. And I had to shut the whole system down and warm it up and pump out the contaminants. So it does take a little bit of practice and keeping a close monitor on it. The interesting thing I found is that the pressure going into the cryostat tends to start dropping as the cold finger gets filled. I'm presuming probably because there's little ice water and other things blocking up the helium flow through the finger. And so I'll see it, you know, a couple of tenths or hundredths of a PSI pressure drop. And that's usually my indication that I'm going to run a, you know, run a clean cycle. Um, one of the questions that came up uh, also in the chat was uh, who was responsible for for the the basically the last piece connecting the magnets to the whole recovery system is that something that you took over because you know your magnets much better than a contractor would or or like, i guess i guess you know, you know who who took care of that last little connection uh, for us, um, we uh, we did it ourselves instead of a uh, contractor because of uh, we have that uh, flex line between uh, a copper line and then um, a magnet between. So we prepare that, and then once they are done, uh, we kind of pump down the line, uh, uh, flush with the uh, uh, helium, and then uh, clean the line out, and we actually connect it between magnet and the, the recovery line. Well, great. I think at this point, um, let's open this up to uh, everyone in attendance. You're free to un unmic yourself and show your pictures and uh, and pepper us with questions. Just not not me. I don't want any questions, but everyone else will be happy to take questions. Clemens uh, apparently thinks we're economists and we do things like uh, d determine the costs of electricity. Well, in, in industry, that's an issue, probably. In industry, it's clearly an issue because you have full cost analysis. And um, over the year, it adds up. But Chris said it's a dollar per liter. and But if you do full cost, it's probably a slightly higher. And uh, we don't get 10 cents a kilowatt hour here. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it, no, it's that's still, right. it, financially, it's still, a, with the cost of helium yeah. being what it is, it's still a significant uh, saving, but I, I will point out that when I first started doing NMR, uh, I was a graduate student, at, at which I, I, revealing my age, I started graduate school in 1967, and we had a variant HA100 spectrometer. I worked with in Sunny Chan's lab at Caltech, and that thing used about pro at least eight kilowatts to uh, continuous to run the magnet. And of course, the university paid for that electricity. And then a few years later, we got a Varian 220, which was the first superconducting commercial NMR. And of course, that used helium. And the question arose, well, should the university pay for the helium as opposed to because they weren't paying for electricity? But of course, the, or the institute in this instance, they weren't, they weren't very uh, receptive to that argument. So uh, any questions from anyone in the audience, please uh, jump in. 
Different question that's purely personal. Uh, has anybody tied their system in with other energy recovery? So if you have a water cool compressor, like tie that in into a uh, energy recovery system, like make a heat pump or something? Not locally, they may do that in the plant, but I, I don't know, Clemens. And our power's cheap, so we don't care anyway. We just, you know, <laughs> burn coal. Uh, I'm gonna follow up on the, the economist uh, comment that was made uh, a little while ago. So at, at our university, a number of years ago, we went through a whole activity-based budget model. And so we were forced to look at the full cost of everything. And, you know, I get, you know, I, I am, I cost a lot of money to, so my time is worth a lot in, in that sense. Um, but I, the way I was able to convince our administration to, to pay for us to tie into a helium recovery system is to use the um, conservation of a non-renewable resource argument. Um, yes, we are going to save some money down the line, um, but the, the real savings is the fact that the helium isn't just boiling away into the universe and is lost forever. So, so if you are still having some difficulty convincing your administration to make the, the investment, um, try that angle as well and, and maybe you'll get uh, better traction. To follow up on that a little bit, Bob, this is Dean Olson at the University of Illinois. And what I found to be a good argument here was to consume as little new helium as possible, thus insulating yourself from fluctuations in the marketplace as much as possible. So that when somebody else has a shortage, maybe you don't. And this uh, sustainability it's another way to think of sustainability. Yes, you're recycling a resource, but yes, you're also sustaining your instrumentation and insulating it from any marketplace forces. So we're yeah. getting uh, some more economic answers here. It looks like people are coming up with uh, three, uh, four liters, uh, $4 per liter uh, with full cost analysis. Yeah, I agree with Dean on that. Um, just having the helium recovery when there is a shortage, you know, you're not completely removed from it, but um, you are insulated from it. And so, you know, you aren't getting into these emergency situations where you can't get helium, uh, you know, or there's a huge, huge backlog of uh, orders or, you know, things like that. So it, it really does insulate you and give you a lot more, um, wiggle room when shortages do occur. So, I mean, that's a huge benefit. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I agree. I'll, I, I will second that. And I think particularly if you're in a, a location which is somewhat distant from a helium distribution point, even under the best of circumstances, if you have an emergency need for helium, you have a lead time and, and you can't get it right away. And we actually had a situation here where somebody in chemistry who had an FTMS magnet was running low on helium because they had done something wrong and they boiled off too much. <laughs> we actually provided them with helium <laughs> to keep them afloat. Well, we're, we've been looking at a system. I, I was always repeatedly asked uh, about this from our administration and it never seemed uh, justifiable to come up with $250,000, which we might recover over 10 or 12 or 15 years. Uh, until all of a sudden money fell into our laps from uh, the NIH, I think. Uh, and then it was like, everyone was on board, let's get this thing installed. But our biggest issue has been uh, space requirements. We didn't have a place to put a bag or that big tank farm, uh, anything like that. It was gonna require renovating a neighboring room and that didn't have any airflow in that room. So that was like a $100,000 proposition there. So we ended up looking at uh, at these direct recovery systems, which I'm now uh, a little wary of from the discussions we're having, but uh, that's something I may follow up with with some of you after this. If anyone wants to comment on uh, the feasibility of a direct recovery system for a, I have a lab with seven NMRs, nothing bigger than 600, but we do have some uh, uh, unshielded magnets. I think you should 
go with at least a medium pressure. And um, I mean, the additional investment, it depends on whether you're purchasing the purifier or not, or whether you go with a, the, I, I assume that the uh, liquid nitrogen based purifier is less expensive. I, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, a, it's about $70,000 cheaper. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's huge. Uh, so, uh, but minus that you've got, um, yeah, you, you need to be able to store, you know, you, you'd like to, with that, that large number of uh, NMRs, you'd like to be able to store helium and a gas form and high pressure is the, really the way to do it. But um, I, I wish there was an easier way where I mean, you, it seems as what we're doing is compressing the gas and then bringing it back to, you know, relatively low medium pressures, cooling it off, then warming it up again and uh and then finally liquefying it so the that would seem to be more efficient if we could figure out how to put all that together but hey ken so my lab i guess um it's not that big my lab is about 1300 square feet and i have three mmr i have 800 shielded a 600 shielded and a, a shielded 500 and i was able to put everything in my lab so I have big, three big storage tanks. I have the the nit nitrogen purifier. I have, I guess, the ATL and then the additional um, uh, helium comp compressor for the, the ATL. And also, I have two cryos probe too, one for the broker and one for the variant. So my lab is actually very packed now. And uh, one thing I want to touch up on the the nitrogen purifier is. Uh, when we were buying it, I was looking at the the, the, the the helium, you know, the ATP, but the cost itself is it's it's about seventy five thousand dollars more. But at the same time, you will need additional water cooling line because it does come with additional helium compressors. So, in my case, I would I, right now I have three helium compressors. But if I would have gone with a helium one, I would have to have four helium compressors, and you know I would need to drop additional utility lines, additional process cooling waters and so you know those costs factor into why we went with the, the nitrogen system but with the nitrogen system the the maintenance you know is a lot more because like we hit the top of the nitrogen once a week and then you know right now we're playing with because this, this is technically our second week our system was installed in early august but because of the wildfire here we had to evacuate so i had to shut everything off and then so i now i just restarted again. So now we, we're trying to figure out how long I can go with the, the cartridge. Perhaps one week or two weeks, th then I had to take out the cartridge and swap it and then pump it down. And so so those are definitely additional w work you have to do with the nitrogen purifier. I just, uh, I'll add uh, with regard to Jack's comment, uh, uh, you can get an air cooled compressor for the ATP, which is what we have, which sits in the room. So uh, that was, I mean, similar with similar considerations and not expensive water. Yeah, and, and one, one other thing is, so because I only have two cooling water drop and then the building told me there's no more cooling power. So what I ended up doing was I bought a, a much bigger water chiller from Haskris. So using one cool, chill water line, but I was able to cool two helium compressors. So that's how, how I was able to get away with you know, using two water lines. A, a comment I could make on the uh, total space for the system that I described, which is the, the high pressure, the ATL, ATP, a bag, and so forth, and so uh, so on. It's about for us, it'd be about 250 square feet. The uh, ATP and the ATL uh, sit in a small office along with their compressors, uh, and then, but we and. Uh, the other stuff is in the in a facilities air, air, uh, area, but you could actually probably squeeze it in within 250 square feet if you wanted to, if that's a goal. Uh, but you still have to bring your all that infrastructure in. We had that that was available to us um, through a different um, renovation phase uh, 20 years ago. So, and we have almost unlimited uh, cooling power in our water. But uh, you now those are real site issues every site's going to have to look at that one thing we don't have a shortage of we have about 16 of these chilled water loop drop downs in our lab i don't know what they were planning for but uh we have excess capacity um 
Any other questions from the audience? I don't know if uh, Dave, are you still here? So uh, are, are there more questions from the audience or? I see one in the uh, chat. It's actually a good question. Uh, yeah. and, uh, it, well, they're all good questions, sorry. Uh, it's from Sarah Whitaker. Uh, she asked about the recovery system using the, the use of heat exchangers. And I noticed, uh, you know, this is, this is interesting. We do not on our, um, on our uh, magnet flash during, during fills, we do not have a heat exchanger that warms up the helium gas. But I, many of the other presentations showed that. We don't have problems with that. We're using flexible lines. We have a lot of room before they uh, get, so this, basically the gas is warming up anyway. Um, but uh, there may be some other you know, experiences why, why, they, why you would want to use a heat exchange. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I, I, we, we initially got worried about this <clears throat> particularly because we were evolving a huge amount of gas filling our Oxford 900. And I subsequently actually had a conversation with Sarah Whitaker who pointed out that once you get rid of this crazy adapter they had on the top of, of the, and, and not only did we get rid of the adapter, but we bought a new transfer line and uh, that improved their efficiency of transfers immensely. Uh, but uh, in fact, what you're saying, what Chris is saying is absolutely correct. Uh, we, in general, even now with the 900, we don't even need it. We hardly need a, a, uh, a heat exchanger because probably within, uh, we have stainless pipe and within maybe 20 feet of the magnet, it's, there's no longer any frost on it. So uh, uh, it's, it, it's probably worth having as a safety precaution in case something happens and you get a lot of gas evolved, but you, you, you can actually be a lot more conservative than what we were. Oh yes, I, I would like to add the comment to that too. Um, we are um, we are installing the heat exchanger uh, because of uh, some of the magnets are too close to the back, and that's one thing. And we don't want to get too uh, cold gas, cold gas uh, helium gaps go into the back, and we were worried, you know, whether the the back will get, you know, a uh, breather and all the stuff. That's one thing. Another thing is we, we also monitor this, um, uh, the flow changes, right? The, the flow gauge, why we were failing. And their uh, temperature rating is um, not, um, not sufficient if we don't use the uh, heat exchanger. So we have to warm up the gas before go through that, um, going through that uh, flow gauge. So that's, that's, that's two reasons why we have to install the uh, heat exchanger. Uh, other than that, uh, the one um, the one in the third floor, uh, the latest one, I did not install the um, the heat exchanger uh, connecting to the back. Yeah, and no, I I agree with you. I mean, you certainly don't want to don't want to risk damaging the bags, and it's it's a very modest expense to install a heat exchanger. Uh, someone has asked in the in the comments, what would happen uh, if you quenched a magnet? that was connected to your helium recovery system. I was just typing an answer to that one. Um, my case, I don't think my system would handle it because normally the gas is going through that little flow meter and I suspect that the pressure would build up to a point and the magnet um, relief valves would kick in and the helium would just be lost at that point. Um, I've only had one quench in the 30 years that I've been, or almost 40 years that I've been working with it. So I'm hoping that's not a real, you know, real viable issue. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it, it's not much different from a quench under any circumstances because uh, normally you'd have a little check valve on the back end if you had no recovery system and it's yeah. not going to handle it anyway. It's just going to go through the relief valves and the magnet. Yeah, yeah the volume is you know, huge. So, yeah. yeah. You know, that's thousands of liters per minute or more. I, mean, yes. I can't imagine that. if you've seen the 900 quench. I saw the one at, uh, <laughs> down in Denver uh, on purpose. I mean, you know, they did that yeah. after when they were bringing it to field. And oh, my goodness. So, yeah, that uh, overwhelms anything. Well, it sounds like we are uh, running out of questions. So um, I'm going to pass it to Dave to, uh, to close up the meeting. Okay. Um, this, this has been a great meeting. I've learned so much about this. 
Um, so maybe I should pass things back to John to say some parting words. Dave, thank you. And uh, uh, once again, all I can say is, wow, these uh, meetings and uh, uh, presentations just get better and better. And uh, just very thankful for uh, everyone's effort. And uh, the, 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 the talks were great, uh, great subject uh, uh, matter. And uh, we're, well, I'm looking forward to next week's meeting. I hope uh, everyone can uh, uh, join us once again. And uh, we are certainly going to continue these for uh, quite some time to come. And uh, we appreciate everyone uh, uh, hanging out with us today. Thank you. Mm. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you. So if there are no other comments, um, uh, I'll declare meeting adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>